I hate starting a week and a pod on a sour note, but it is over. It was good while it lasted, but it's over. It's time we just accept it. Eric Ten Hag, we will miss you. This is the Arsenal Vision Post Match Podcast. My name is Elliot Smith, the Goodbye Man Twitter, Gunner. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm really down. I'm really down in the dumps. And and football is the only thing that can make you feel this way. News of Eric Ten Hag being sacked has has hit me hard. Um, it was an era that I I think it's fair to say I soaked the joy out of it. You know how I always say when football gives you joy, you should take it. I, I think it is fair to say I am one of the people that quite heavily and effectively took the joy out of the Eric Ten Hag era at Manchester United. It ends, I think, iconically with a loss to West Ham that is based on or or predicated on a horrendous refereeing decision to give West Ham a penalty that is never a penalty. And Eric Ten Hag gets to go out really on the high note of being able to complain that if that penalty had not been given, he would have kept his job and he would have gone on to achieve uh, immense things there. We will miss him. The Rude Van Nistelrooy era begins, but hopefully uh, a short one to be followed by the Gareth Southgate era. We can keep our fingers crossed for that. But this is the Arsenal Vision Podcast, so we will not be talking about that a whole heck of a lot. We will be talking about uh, a performance against Liverpool that I'm proud of. We'll see if if Clyde feels the same way and if those of you listening feel the same way. Um, The challenges of that performance, I want to just say this up front. We will touch on the contentious refereeing decisions, but I think collectively... We may have gone too far down rabbit holes, and I say this for myself, I'm not speaking for anybody else, of emphasizing referees and emphasizing media narrative. And one of the things we can do in this little bubble of ours is not have to go down that rabbit hole and really focus on the football and the players we have available and what we're trying to accomplish. So let's do that up front. How about that? And then towards the tail end of the pod, we could certainly cover the impact of some of those things, um, you know, towards the back end. Last quick update, Um, we will have a power rankings pod this week. You got to when Spurs lose and United lose um, and Ten Hag gets sacked. So we'll do that. We will get a rewatch of the Liverpool game. Been a while since we did that. So we'd love to have you, um, you know, come join us for that stuff. If you can't, totally understand, but we're here for you either way. So I think with that, we can get on with it. And here with you now is Clive. You can find him on Twitter at Clive PFC. Hello, Clive. Hello, hello. You and I are both dealing with some man flu, but we are going mm-hmm. to uh, we're going to set that to one side because if our players can play ninety minutes of football at the highest level, half fit, unfit, doing their best, we just can't afford to be down a man. We can't afford to be down a man. Tim's unavailable. Paul's unavailable. You and I have um, with heavy strapping on. That sounds <laughs> a little weird when I say it. Have shown up to do the job, right? Yeah, gonna be here, right? The big games, Liverpool's mm-hmm. a big game. We were going to hope to have all of us, wouldn't we? But I think it's half term for the kids over here, so Tim's got to do his work, and uh, and Paul, well, Paul's just crazy man. He could be yeah. in any meeting. <laughs> so, uh, he, he, who knows? Who knows? He is a captain of industry, and as such, can only be available at certain times. Um, so, well, we got Paul's thoughts on the instant reaction. That's more than anybody needed to hear of that. Obviously, the the fun thing about the instant reaction we do stocks rising and stock falling, and like. Obviously, no two people agree on anything, so it's just a torrent of people <laughs> disagreeing with you. Um, I saw Scott get, getting on social media to let us know what he thought of our stock rising and stock falling, so everybody getting in on the act. Um, okay, Clive, I think the first thing I want to do is start with you is just sort of where you're at emotionally about this result and about where we sit at the moment, because we'll, we'll get on to the, the lineup, the performance, and all that stuff, but I think there's a wide spectrum of how people are reacting to this. So just give me your 30,000-foot view uh, full time of that match where you are right now so <clears throat> even beyond even beyond the match right let's talk about where we are emotionally about Arsenal football club right mm-hmm. i think i do think that's a discussion to have about how we we want to enjoy what we're seeing versus how we are allowed to enjoy what we're seeing you know i do think some of the things that we read and see and from the famous people out there that seem to get prominence and influence the whole atmosphere and ecosystem around football, they do get into our heads on occasion. So people can throw it at certain stations, at certain TV stations, but it's more or less the individuals and how they act. The stations do many, many different things. So it's the, it's the individuals within that framework. And, and they are there. We're smart people. We're smart people that listen to these podcasts. So we're talking idiots, right? They are there to re, you know, to engage us, to create engagement. So for them to say, oh, Arsenal did pretty well for their injuries and their half-fit players, we know that, but it's not really exciting. For them to say, well, the manager's like Jose Mourinho and he needs to push on more and he needs to do this, he needs to win with 10 men, he needs to stop celebrating, he needs to stop 
being open and naive. And then when we are close the door, we say, well, they're too defensive. We need to push out more. At least have one. You can't win. You literally can't win. And once you work this out, you have to decide how you want to consume your football media. Mm. You have to decide who you want to spend your time with. And you have to, and I'm realizing now that I'm going to be really selective about what I read and see and how will it affect me. Because I'll be straight with you, in the last couple of weeks, you know, maybe last month or so, bits of things have impacted me because I think it brings us at a disadvantage. The whole labeling of Arsenal around these dark hearts, etc., we cannot say that it's not affecting the referees on 50 50 decisions. So we can laugh and we can try to close off, but it has an impact because when you see the very same said scenarios occur for other teams and lesser punishments are being handed out, I can't tell another adult, a human being, to say, you can't feel this way, keep your head up, keep going, because there's a bit of me that feels that way. And it's really mm. concerning, you know, it's really concerning. But with, more importantly, I've had many people reach out to me and say, saying he's turning them off the game. I, I, mm. I love football with all of my being. And... I don't want people turned off the game. <laughs> you know, I want more people <laughs> turning on to the yeah. game. But you know what? Yeah. Maybe the way we manage the game, the maybe how we control the game, maybe how we promote the game, needs to be thought about in a way where we want more people to enjoy it. That's, and I, I think we're losing that focus. I really do. We are focusing on the wrong thing. We should be focusing on more people enjoying it, growing the game, in every single facet of our of our society, in a positive way, and at the moment we are focused on so many negatives. This and I, I, we need to change it. So you, with your humour and how you look at life <laughs> and how you look at football, we need you to lift some people up. Maybe, uh, maybe for those who are thinking, you know, what, I'm sick of it. I'm sick of it. Find your find your place. Find your place to enjoy it. Find your people to enjoy it with. And really invest in that. And don't invest in some of the mainstream because they're not there to help you. They really are not there to help you. That makes sense, Elliot. And and yeah, of course. And it's compounded by social media, right? Because you're just going to have the the bigger the clickbait, the more the rage bait, the more it's going to wind up on your timeline. And if you combine social media with mainstream media, you're going to find yourself not engaging with interesting tactical analysis or the data behind the game or a real understanding of what happened on the pitch and and what's happening behind the scenes at Arsenal, you're going to find yourself engaging with trolls. And Mm. trolls exist to do one thing, live under bridges and make your life miserable. Um, And, you know, living under a bridge can be nice, but make your life miserable, not so much. So avoid the trolls. Don't feed the trolls. Um, And that's kind of the whole point. My, My headspace is a little different. I went into this game in evaluation mode because... We we won at Aston Villa. We won at Tottenham. We were within the last kick of the game from winning at City down to 10 men in a game where 11 v 11, I think we were the better team. Yeah. But in all the other games, you know, weird things have gone. Southampton, Leicester, we were excellent. We got weird goals conceded, but ultimately battered them. They're the 10 men games. We've had a lot of injuries. I went into this wanting to really get my my eyes on what is this Liverpool team and where do we stack up against them? Because outside of city, it seems like these are the the two that want to be considered the contenders. And I come away from it feeling very clearly that that team is not a team I'm worried about, yeah. that we are better than that team, that a depleted arsenal was better than that team. Now we will come on to the portions of the game where maybe we weren't able to take it to them and why that was the case and the tactical changes that had to be made. But I I came away very proud of this team and very appreciative for Mikel Arteta because I think that there are a lot of clubs out there, a lot of teams out there that facing the kind of injury issues and, and tactical decisions that had to be made as um, repercussions of those injury issues would fold, would would give Liverpool exactly what they need to to do the things Liverpool are good at. They wound up with 0.8 expected goals in this game. 0.8. And that's with their two goals coming from basically close-range big chances. Other than that, they created nothing. They weren't able to break us down. They looked vulnerable. When we had possession and we had our players in there, we were really able to bring the game to them. I saw a Liverpool team that, don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to say they're bad. This isn't Eric Ten Hag we're talking about. But I think that's a Liverpool team that is maybe at the end of a cycle and with a new manager. Weird sort of transitional moment. I think they'll be good. I'm not scared of that team. I saw an Arsenal 
that to me, 11 v 11 is still the best team in this league, even when depleted. And a lot of that comes down to Mikel Arteta. So whether the media wants to say he's Jose Mourinho or he's Pep Guardiola, I don't care who you want to analogize him to. What he is is a manager who minds the details with such precision and consideration that he can reshape his team despite major absences, to still have a game model that can be better than one of the best teams in the league when they have all their key players fit. And so, Clyde, before we actually get into the nuts and bolts of it, what are your thoughts on that? I I just think we come away with this outside of the, forget the media bubble. For me watching this team in evaluation mode, it reminded me of how good we are and that if we can just get these marginal moments, these injuries, these marginal refereeing decisions out of the way. I don't think there's much to stop us, really. Yeah, so when I'm not on the podcast, I always think, I listen in, I think, ah, oh, I'm like the listeners, right? I think, ah, oh, they didn't say this, they didn't say that, and I sort of get <laughs> semi-angry with you without ever I'm like the listeners, the though, you have a chance to come on and say it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> get that out of your system, yeah. And so, <laughs> but I did, I have to say this, you know, I'll tell it to you offline as well, that your sort of takes on Liverpool pre-game were really, really good. And it got me into a good place. And actually around Liverpool, maybe they called last season the last dance with Klopp being there. But I actually mm. think this season is the last dance for them. They haven't changed mm. much. The players are exactly the same. They moved Gavin Birch around to make him more prominent. But basically, everyone's the same, apart from Chiesa, who can't put one foot in front of the other. Right? So, mm. so it's the same group. So the manager's come in, he slowed them down, given a bit of control. They're not all at 100 miles an hour. The way for opportunities, but it's the same group with some Premier League greats in that team. Let's be honest, we're we're football people. Van Dijk, Trent, Salah, these are decent, right? They did decent players. <clears throat> Excuse me, with the goalkeeper, we wasn't there, but we're talking four or some of the top quality players in the last six, seven years. <clears throat> Sorry, yeah. and um, and so basically. I thought, you know, it's going to be interesting. So we read all about Liverpool. We've seen their results. We know they're not being tested. I watched them against Chelsea. I thought Chelsea had a were better than people were saying. Mm-hmm. So what are they like? And by the way, by half time, my thought my thought was, mm. we're be- we're you and I both fighting it. <laughs> yeah, we are. We are better than them. We are better than them. That was my feeling. I genuinely felt it while knowing we were not at our best, even at not at our best. We were better than them. And, and they felt it, mate. They felt it, Elliot. You look around the pitch, people at their extremities, they were struggling to hold on to us. I really felt strongly, and I said it in the IR, I felt strongly that Anthony Taylor, forget the big incidents, mate, because they just happen. His, his lack of understanding of just a football collision just, mm. just really did get me. It really got me. And the thing that got me, I don't know if you guys listen, agree with me or not, I thought he misread a lot of the aerial challenges. He allowed our players to be hit in the air while they're trying to win it, and he just didn't let do anything about it. You know, and I thought, but that affects the second ball, right? And the second ball is a key to create momentum. And I just thought, you're not very smart. Honestly, I, I just <laughs> thought you're not very smart. And, it, and so uh, without trying to get into referees again, I just felt he was looking to get through that game without doing anything silly. You know, he looked to... He looked to he lacked authority, Elliot. I'll tell you, mate. He lacked authority on that pitch. He looked concerned. And this comes back to the whole environment of refereeing and officiating. We watch European games. I just don't get that feeling. Is it me? Do I know too much about him? Do I know too much about what he reads? Do I know his influences? Do I know where he lives? Do I know all of 25 games, previous games, he's refereed against us? Are we all too familiar with each other? Mm. You know, it's 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 yeah. a problem, isn't it? It's it's a problem, you know, and um, and it makes people think, you know. So, so yeah, going back to how I felt about Liverpool, I was slightly disappointed in a minute, if I'm honest with you. I was slightly disappointed. I thought they'd be a bit better, and maybe if anything, it won't feel like it today because we keep losing people, but we are finding people at the same time. Yeah. We are finding people, and when we get back to full health. We'll be able to bring on, you know, in a, in a game, four or five top quality, fit and ready, world class players to come on that pitch when we're all back, and this is going to really hold some good stead over Christmas when the games are coming through. 
So we just got to hang in there until we get the bodies back and hope Gabrielle's injury is not too bad. And then I will be fine, honestly. Yeah, and to the point, it's not just that we found new people. We found people to be what we might need them to be because by picking Thomas Party at right back, Declan Rice had to play six. And you know what? Declan Rice can play six. You know, I think we got that answer, didn't we? Mikel Marino, he can play. He can play our yep. football. And I think with the selection, Mikel did something really smart. Look, I don't think it takes a genius because we talked about it on this pod. Um to know that where we might have had an advantage in this game was in the midfield with our physicality and our athletes in there against what I think is a lightweight Liverpool midfield. And Mikel made a big decision, a big decision that I don't think a lot of managers would have made. I'm going to move my right back to center back and I'm going to move my central midfielder to right back. He had Timber, right? He had Kivior, he had Zinchenko. He could have picked a back four with Timber on the right and Zinchenko on the left or Kivior on the left, they played there, or even Miles Lewis Skelly, but he didn't. He said, I'm going to put Timber up against Salah because I know he can handle him, and I'm going to trust Thomas Party and Ben White on the right because I trust our structure. And what that's going to let me do is pick three dual winners, three physical monsters, three athletes in Rice, Marino, and Kai in midfield, and they're going to bully and dominate that Liverpool midfield. And I think it worked an absolute treat. And by the way, in doing that, let me give you some data that Billy Carpenter tweeted out. Salah, when Timber was on, one of seven in attacking duels, zero of four on crosses, zero fouls drawn, zero dribbles completed. Only shot was on a loss he had nothing to do with. I mean, that was what Mikel got the payoff for. He put Timber on Salah. He shut down the one guy who has the ability to change a game with a moment of brilliance. And he let our midfield, I think, really physically control the game. So I want to ask you if you see it similarly. Obviously, Saka and Timber being fit was huge for this game. But do you see see it similarly to how I do with what his decisions were about and how they played out? Yes. So Saka and Timber, the, the thing is, they weren't fit. And he knew they weren't fit. Mm. And by that, I mean he knew they weren't going to last. And so you imagine it now, you're watching the game, you're thinking, okay, I've got two players on there not going to last the game, for definite. Mikel Moreno hasn't played a 90 minutes for a long time, managed it. He probably didn't know he could manage it until this very day. Um, so you've got a situation there. We didn't expect the Gabriel injury, you know, and, um, and so Declan Rice never gets a rest from anybody, does he? So he just has to keep playing. Havertz has had a rest recently, and if anything, I think has lacked a little bit of dual certainty while he's come back from that little injury. I still think he's working his way back. That could be somebody just not training as often to the highest levels to make sure he can, he can be available. So, yeah, I think we had a choice with, with Timber. If um, Califiori was fit, I think Timber would have played right centre-back, and um, White would have played right back. That's what I think would have happened. But on this day, it's the right thing to do. He's a perfect body for Salah. And again, the narrative of Timber, he just basically had a lower body breakdown, didn't he? Because he hasn't trained. And so basically the narrative is Salah scored late, but he did nothing while Timber was on. Nothing at all. And Salah is their, he's their true outlet. He's the one who's got the highest average position. He doesn't work back as much. And they, he's their target. He's their basically their centre forward out, out wide. But Timber just handled him. He wasn't always smooth. He's on the ball stuff a little bit sloppy because he hasn't played, right? So everyone, when well, you haven't played, everyone, all the bodies are dashing around in front of you. You pass the ball and they've already moved. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Because he's just not quite sharp enough. Mm. But I thought he was he was excellent. He's an excellent player. He just, he just need, we just need to use him sparingly a little bit until he gets his body right. But because of Tom Yasu, because of a little bit of Califiori getting injured, and because of Zinchenko, we've had to play him probably too much. And it probably, could. if he was fit for 90, we sort these out. No problem at all. No problem. Well, I mean, it's it's everything. I, I don't want to get into this too much right now, maybe later in the pod. But like, to win a title, it's so funny. When we did our preview pod and we talked about what we thought would happen this season, the thing that I brought up a number of times is progress isn't always linear because there are things that are outside of your control, refereeing decisions, injuries, things like that. And it just feels like all the marginal stuff, right? If that... Saliba red card isn't a red. Not only do I think we beat Bournemouth, but I know we beat Liverpool, right? And oh, by the way, Van de Ven got a yellow for something even more egregious, so we just keep seeing it, right? All the marginal things. What if Van Dyke gets sent off for the kickout? We've, we've had three sendings off that are all 
extremely marginal. Do I think Van Dyke should be sent off for that? Probably not. Yeah. But one marginal call going for us changes a whole season. Hasn't happened yet. How many penalties did we have last season? We haven't had a single one this season. I think we had one red card last season, right? We've already had three. So my point isn't refereeing or uncertainty, but between the combination of injuries and marginal calls, if that goal is not disallowed, if the if Van Dyke is punished for the kickout, right? If Martinelli gets his penalty, I don't think any of the decisions are black and white. They're all marginal. Yeah. But right now it feels like the marginal things, including injuries, just aren't quite going for us. Now, I don't think that can last a whole season. I mean, it can, but I don't think it will. And if that turns around, look out, league. Because if we start getting the marginal calls in our favor, if we start keeping players fit, suddenly, you know, as well as we're doing with everything against us, backs to the wall, imagine what we do with the wind at our back. Now, I think it's already too late in the podcast to praise the ever-loving crap out of Bakayo Saka, so we have to do that. I think <laughs> this guy comes into this game not fully fit. It is a big game. We come into it in a bad moment psychologically, maybe, having lost a game to Bournemouth, having not impressed against Shakhtar to the extent that anybody cares about that, but it certainly wasn't the spirit-lifting result. And what does Bakayo do? He spends the whole first half saying, I'm him. I am him. Not just the goal, but all of his influence, all the times. I mean, Robertson was toast, could not live with him at all helping back to protect Thomas Party at right back, then getting forward, beating men, receiving on the on the interior, all the things that he was doing so brilliantly. Um, he was just sensational. And, um, you know, the goal, a bit Lamine Yamal from the Classico, a bit Salah from the reverse fixture last season. Um, I, I can't say enough good things about him, Clive, but we we sometimes forget that when you're missing players, you're not going to be as good. And I think what Saka reminded us coming back in is, oh yeah, having your best players makes you better. And he was phenomenal. Yeah, I keep thinking back to the fact that he is now our skipper. He's one of the leaders in the dressing room, and he's starting mm-hmm. to look like it. You know, um, I, I love the goal. You know, little little show and go in behind, but mate, oh, I said this earlier today. Actually, the way he chopped it back and bounced it through his legs. To bounce it through someone's legs is the ultimate humiliation, Elliot, because that means when you're standing there, your feet are the, are the widest part. If you mm. bounce it, you're, you've got to be so accurate to bounce it through a narrow space, and he bounced it through at a higher level than his feet. And <clears throat> Mate, did you have... Well, he sort of, he's ever to me, so he sort of flashed in. I thought, oh, what a great goal. When I watched it with a camera angle, it was a goal the moment he chopped him, wasn't it? It was a goal. The way he addressed the ball, it was just a goal. And um, mm. it, was just, it had a sense of inevitability about it. And um, to have that in your team at 23 years of age, and what he's doing at regarding creating, assisting, and scoring, yeah, I, I, there's nothing else to say, really, apart from the fact that I was watching Liverpool players run around trying to double up and triple up on him. You want to see how scared they were. Not the guy just, just facing him out because he was already done. Right? One's not enough. Mm. It's how quick they can get to two and three. And at the end of the game, the, all the Liverpool players were just crowding around him, you know, shaking by the hand, talking to him. Utter respect. So forget what people say about comparing him to this player and that player. Just look at the tactics of the game and how teams absolutely fear him. Um, they knew Robertson is not the same player he used to be. And he's done well against him in the past. Let's not pretend he's an idiot because he's done. he's got a few medals in his back pocket. But he's not up to him anymore. That he, that's, that's over for him. He's having a bad day today. If I was him, I wouldn't switch on your phone, son. It's a bad, <laughs> it's a bad day for you. <laughs> and and, and you, got, you better find another. <laughs> can't come back in next year. You can't. You got, they got to get somebody else. right? Because it's going to be even worse next year. He's going to get better. And you won't. Mm-hmm. That's just nature of football, right? You sometimes find your level and that's it at this moment in time. So, yeah, Saka is just... Um, I did read somewhere that his, his overall numbers were not as high as his previous game. But again, how he can have such impact by maybe just in the moments that he has the ball, his decision-making when to release is just perfection. How he senses three people. Says, okay, you got three here now? Okay, slice through you then with that pass. Deal with that on the other side of the pitch. 
he's just very, very good, very, very intelligent, and he makes it look so easy. And um, we're very lucky to have him, aren't we? Very lucky. We really are. He He's really spectacular player, and you can shift three players over to him, and he still beats you. And in some instances, by doing that, you know, you create the opportunity for other players to thrive. He does all the work at both ends of the pitch. Um, you know, watch that Classico. The, the Real Madrid team it's is very, me. very talented. But I'll tell you something. They don't have players that are committed to doing all parts of the game the way yeah. Bukayo Saka is committed to doing everything in the game. I think a little love for Ben White, by the way, Clive, who yeah. plays an absolutely inch perfect ball from a position he hasn't played in. Here's a guy. This is what I love about this team. You got players like Ben White. Maybe not been fully fit all season. Maybe not been playing at his absolute best level all season. Gets told to move over and play center back in a big fixture. Doesn't put a foot wrong and assists a goal with an inch perfect pass. Yeah, I mean the pass was one thing because he couldn't miss it, right? But just to generally, the comps out there, the listener will find them, mm-hmm. mate. You know, I didn't realize how good he was until I started to see them some of those clips. He was he was excellent, and again, he just settled into the role. And people say, oh, they can't do it without Sleeper. Well, we we didn't do it without Sleeper a couple of years ago because we had players that just weren't to that level. Our replacement also got injured. And so we're down to our third choice. We all know the story. But we've moved on. It's a shame that we can't... You know, we've been stretched beyond our depth almost. You know, to end the game with 17-year-olds and 18-year-olds on the pitch, that's quite hard. This is Liverpool, right? This isn't, this isn't Bolton. That's quite hard to mm. do, you know? So... um. Really impressed with him. You know, also, you know, he knows he's under pressure as well for his position, you know, because Timber's not, he's no scrub, right? So, um, mm. but he just relaxes into it, just relaxes into it and plays the game like an adult. When he has to go and head it, he heads it. He stays tight. When he wins it, you know, the old reg- regain, retain thing I love, he wins it, but he doesn't just tackle, he passes in his tackle. One touch into the into the midfield, into the attack, and we're off. These details are so important to create momentum, and he just knows how to do it, you know. And um, yeah, we again we found another player, didn't we, in Ben White? Because you're absolutely right. I don't think he's been fit. He's been carrying. We sat him. He got took off in the European game, so he didn't get sent off. But he walks into this game fresh and just enough minutes in his legs to have that type of performance. And um, yeah, top top stuff. Yeah, another player we should probably quickly just touch on is the Thomas Party performance because I'll admit the right side of our defense I was really nervous about. You know, I, I I would not have had the courage to pick the lineup Mikel did. He got it obviously spot on as I think the first half performance showcased, but my reasoning was in part just that Ben White moved over from right back to right center back, having then Thomas Party to his right at right back. They read the game so well. Party made the decision, I think, to be aggressive, to to jump balls, to go in early, to to go after Diaz first time early. Don't let him set you up, get you off balance, and beat you. He beat him the one time at the start of the second half that led to Diaz sort of running into Raya. But other than that, he had Diaz's number by being early and quick to things. He's showing a, a level of physicality and athleticism that I think I'd kind of ruled out of his game. But I think when you ask that player to go play that position in this game and he does it at that level it'd be crazy not to give it a mention. So another really important aspect of the performance and someone who in a season where we've had some players maybe not hit the level we want or not be available, he's gone the opposite direction. He's been at a level that I sort of had admittedly ruled out for him um, before this season started. Yeah, you weren't alone, mate. There are lots of people out there. Some of the people, you know, that said, I hate the term, said he's washed, it's over, finished. Mm. And I always always rallied against that. That's the bit I rallied against. The future may not include him, but I, to say someone was watched, I thought he was wrong. I thought he was an inexperienced player working his way through preseason. That's what they do. They under, I think for mm. once, he, under, he understands his body and he knows when to go and when to say, you know what, I need to hold this. I think he's played the, the most minutes of any outfield player this season. And so that's a phrase I didn't think I'd be saying at this point of the year. It's, just, right? so, it's the one bit of luck we've gotten, right? I mean, ironically, him staying fit has been the one bit of injury luck we got and the one I would not have expected. You know? Yeah, it's like anything. If he, if he has a little car strain now, people will say, that's it, he's injury prone. Mm, it's yeah. like the Martinelli misses a chance. He's not clinical enough. I knew it. You know, mm. So um, it's just one of those things. So I know he's just a little car strain away from all the old, the old stuff coming out again. 
But I'm just so pleased that he looks engaged. And when he has to play right back, he does it well. And when he plays in midfield, he does it really well. There was a point in that first half where I thought he was our best midfielder and our best fullback. You know, and then he was getting to all the second balls and he was really pivotal. And again, you know, I, I, I came to this game thinking about Gravenberg and thinking about McAllister and I knew Curtis Jones had a good game in his, against Chelsea. I thought, oh, they're going to play him, they're going to play Slobosai. These are good players, mate. I didn't see any of them. Did you see any of them? I didn't nope. see any of them, you know? No. Nope. And if you're Liverpool today, you're thinking, okay, I, I don't see any. I just didn't see anything from them in there, you know. And um, and so yeah, we dominated that space. And hey, look, we need we need more bodies back. We need more bodies back before we start opening open top bus. We need more bodies back, and yeah. then we can see this team. We still haven't seen it yet. We're just we're just getting through it. I just never would have thought a couple of seasons ago I'd be saying this, but what I saw in Liverpool, I, not a bad team, by the way. I, I want to be careful here. Like I still think they're good. Yeah. Um, but that's a team that physically can't compete with us, which is not a thing I would have said. And even as, as depleted is that how as we it looked were, on TV screen, because I've just, it, I didn't get that. It looked feeling. to me, I, I'm not, yeah, what, what do you think? No, 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 mate, I'm not, I'm not arguing with you. I just thought we moved the ball better and quicker and we were just had better players. For, for, but I didn't get that feel. I like you sometimes on TV, you get that feeling when you see races being lost at the level of the camera. Races and were like lost, that. but also like, you know, going and trying to take, take, take the ball off rice and him being able to shield it and they can't mm. get around his big body and Marino being able to poke a ball away earlier or win duels. I feel like we had in our bag that we could go long. You know, Klopp's teams used to go long, yeah. not all the time, but they would, they'd go over you to, to where their talent was. And we, we were winning those long balls. We, I think, in a game that was starting to be decided by second balls, we were we yeah. were best to all of them, you yeah. know. Um, and obviously, I have a big theory that I want to put forward to you about the second half, where people complain that we sat too deep, and I'll, we'll come to that in a bit. But quickly on a couple of goals. So on their goal, they get the the goal from the corner. I mean, obviously, if Saliba's there, you'd like to think maybe we do a little bit better. Um, we wind up with. A, a little bit of misfortune, right? Just Diaz gets the ball near post. It's a it's a really well worked routine, but somehow Van Dyke, the ball finds its way right to him, surrounded yeah. by three Arsenal players, but in just enough room. Um, again, you know they wind up with two goals from two very big chances, and they're the only things they created. Any thoughts on on the set piece defending? It's a good routine from them. It's it's not the best defending, but there's also a bit of fortune in the ball finding Van Dyke there. Yeah, so a, a couple of things. Just going rolling back a little bit. If you mm -hmm. look at our team and draw a line down the middle. I thought the line on our right hand side was really, really good. Really, really good. Yeah. On our left hand side, Gabriel apart, I thought there was room for improvement on that, on that left hand side. You know, from a obviously Timber was doing his job, but I think you know, there were players on that left hand side that weren't quite where, it, where I hoped they would be. But we'll get onto that later. Um, mm -hmm. For the goal, they clipped the ball over over Tom's party's head to Diaz because every time I went short, he got smashed. So let's let's get him running backwards. Classic. Let him come short. Let him run. Let's run him back and see if, see how many times he wants to run back. And to be fair, I was a bit worried about that from before the game started. Party gets back in, and he actually wins it early in the duel. Yep. But he doesn't quite bounce his way, so he has to win it again. And when winning it again, he was he wasn't he was a bit awkward, and he gave the corner away. He's right in front of me, so I can see everything. Right, so um, gave the corner away. On the corner, I thought, okay, let's see this how we set up. But I've got to be honest with you, mate, again, just looking at other analysis, not my own, that front post zone with, ha with Havertz there, he, he got done a little bit on the front post. Now, Havertz has a fantastic record there. His clearance, his numbers are right up there. But he got done against, it was not say done against Bournemouth, but there were signs people are targeting that area. So I think he has to maybe change his body shape a little bit. So he can see what's coming around him. So rather than stand looking at the ball, mm. just stand square with your back to the to the byline, if that makes sense, a little bit squarer. So you can get your arm out so you can see what's coming past you. You know, and um or maybe it's a communication thing. Because he was just a step slow. And once you get first contact, you're thinking, Well, you're hoping that we're gonna get second contact. Mate, for them to just drop on his head like that, it's just like, Oh my god. And I'll be honest with you, I didn't sense anything from them until that ball went in. And they thought, hadn't oh, done God, anything. It's Nothing. Like, it just felt like, oh, dear. Do you know what I mean? What's, that, what's all that about? Because our goal They had different. one shot from 29 yards out 
prior to that goal. <laughs> yeah. And so I'm I'm also, you know, going to keep keep it honest here. We are set piece FC. So I wonder how many teams feel that against us, you know, that we just come mm, along, get a set point. piece and walk away. So we have to take it when it happens to us. But it, honestly, it felt like there was no pressure leading up to it. It's just a long ball that we just got, I got a lucky toe to get it out for a corner. And then basically they, they score from it. You know, two, a two contact goal in the box. It's like, oh no, how's that happened? You know? Mm-hmm. And, I, and I was I was worried, Eric. I thought maybe they are good. I thought, you know, maybe they are good. But we got back in control of it again. And I thought they're not that good. You know, it's just mm. it's just disappointing that we didn't quite get the second goal before they scored. You know, because if we did, I think I still think we hold on while knowing that we we're gonna have fatigue in the second half. They had three shots in the first half. The goal, which was a big chance because it's yeah. point blank header. Other than that, they had two shots for a total of 0.1 expected goals. Um, th- there just wasn't much in it, which is why it was so frustrating to get pegged back that way in particular, where I think we are quite strong and you would expect us to, to handle it pretty well. Um, it felt more unfortunate than like we had done anything wrong. I think one of our best periods of the game was actually from the time they equalized to the half. I think we played really well. Um, I, I want to pick out two players, but Let's do Marino first. He goes down with what looks like a shoulder injury, and I'm thinking the worst. Here we go. Bad luck again. He's re-injured the shoulder. He's gone. Up to that point, I think he had been a little bit in and out of the game, and I don't think he'd impressed me very much. He had the ball roll under his foot that one time, which led to actually that 29-yard shot that I mentioned from Salah. He was trying to catch Raya off his line. It was after the ball had rolled under uh, Marino's foot, so a dangerous moment there. He comes back from the shoulder injury, and all of a sudden he's just fantastic for the rest of the game. I thought he was really good. Um, you talk about brilliant Rice's timing, uh, Rice's delivery, two deliveries to Marino on free kicks, two perfect deliveries. Yeah. One Marino can't quite get his foot right. The second he gets it perfect. And it's, it's just one fluid motion, the rice kick, the Marino run, the goal off. He goes to celebrate, uh, and then seven and a half minutes of VAR using MS paint in a van outside the Emirates. Um, you know, richest league, best league in the world. But uh, yeah, it's it's a brilliant moment. Thoughts on that goal and on Marino in particular? Yeah. So again, I'm trying to be consistent in my analysis of players because I think sometimes we put too much emphasis on the odd mistake, and mm-hmm. Marino makes that mistake. And if Salah puts it top corner, then we have a conversation, aren't we? Right. But mm-hmm. he had a Steven Gerrard moment in the middle of midfield. And we could all see it. I said, oh, not sure about him. Not sure about him. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, um, <laughs> I'm not sure about him. He's running around a little bit slow in Lacazette's boots. We need to worry about him. You know, so. Um, there was a so, slander name for him going around the Discord that I <laughs> was not enjoying. That's what it was. <laughs> yeah. I, I think he was being called Midrino, but um, <laughs> thankfully that did not last. Yeah. And, um, but funny enough, there was a ball, and I've seen a picture of it. There was a ball to the left-hand corner of the of the area, a high ball, and he brought it down like Dennis Bergkamp's statue, right? He literally did the flying Hung Kung Fu kick up in the air and brought it down. Everyone went, oh, like that. And almost from that moment onwards, I could see him. Do you know what I mean? Mm. And it's almost like, I mean, he's joined the club now. So I didn't see the shoulder injury so close. I just saw that. And he looked really quite good. We looked like one of us. So as far as I was yep. concerned, he dominated the area. I didn't see him stand out as much as Rice, but I didn't see him behind people, three yards away. Do you know what I mean? Not in contact, not engaged. I saw somebody helping us control the midfield, spinning out wide we needed to, playing passes at the right time with the right weight and the right pace. And I thought, yeah, you're you're fine. You're absolutely fine. Rice is shot stroke cross for the um for the goal was like a bully out of a gun, mate. I, I don't know how he did that. If I do that, that's going over the bar, right? It's going to be literally... <laughs> how does he do that at that pace? I mean, these Liverpool defenders, I mean, Canate, I was really... I was generally quite impressed with Canate. I thought he was really quite good. Sofa scores got him low. I'm thinking, you know, watch the game, mate. I thought he had a massive influence <laughs> on the game. Um, and If Canate's not there, Martinelli has a very different game. Yes, because he had the roasting of Trent, but Kanate did a brilliant job ca- covering over in a and number. And getting of back situations. into the middle, and this is an issue. This yep. is my issue yep. with the team a little bit. <clears throat> I don't think we work Kanate inside enough and Van Dyke inside enough. It, it helped us dominate midfield, 
but I don't, I don't think we worked them over enough in there. That's my that's my feeling. Um, but again, that's where we are at the moment in our in our evolution of our health. So yeah, what an unbelievable cross! But then he just put the header in, no fuss, mm. just bang. That's like oh, that's a bit. That's a bit like a Spanish midfielder does when they were trying to win the Euros. <laughs> you know? Oh, we those players we play for other teams, didn't they? Quite efficient in the box. You know, we haven't got those. We missed four before they go in. It felt really nice that we just the ball got what it deserved, you know. So um when I saw it back, mm. it's like God, that, that, he made that look really easy, didn't he? You know, so um yeah, decent, decent performance. And as the game wore on, it felt like he and Rice really sort of understood each other on the piston, so to speak, right? One dropping, one going. Yeah. When Rice carried it forward, M- Marino had his back. It it started to round into shape, I think, understandably, with Party out of the midfield and those two in those roles. It took just a little bit of time to click, but once it clicked, I, you know, I, I it was like they were just dancing through tulips in that Liverpool <laughs> midfield. There was, there was yeah. nothing for them to worry about. So you know? I think it's going to be interesting to see how we, when we rewatch it, we we assess the balance of of the midfield mm-hmm. properly assess it because I happen to think all three of them were in midfield on occasions, you know, and um, it was a collective effort. And if anything, Havertz was also dropping into the right hand side, the top of the box type thing. And so it was a collective. As Chelsea showed, if you surround Liverpool's midfield, they can't do a lot, you know. And um, they and so I thought we did really well as a collective. I do think. People are trying to judge Marino and, and Rice, and quite rightly, they want to see the new thing and see how it all goes together and see Rice at six. You know what? You see, what will be will be. As we've seen in this game, Gabriel sits on his backside and we suddenly lose the best central defender in the country. We don't know for how long. So let's wait and see what happens going forward. But the real test of that balance will be when Odegaard comes back, you know, because I don't think there's enough um, ball play with Rice and Marino on their own, but Rice, Marino and Odegaard, that yep. could be a really good balance, right? So, yeah. until Odegaard's Especially back... Especially if you have Timber or Calafiori uh, inverting, right? Two players very comfortable on the ball. Well, it's just, regardless of... Yeah, maybe, Elliot, maybe. But it's just that ability to move the ball forward quickly and timely. Mm-hmm. And you don't know it's not there until you haven't got it. So, we had it in yep. this game um, through party. And I thought Rice got better as the game went on. And I thought Marino was slightly higher up and he was more of the second ball guy, the guy that was a little bit slightly more advanced. But hey, look, we're finding new systems all the time and new ways of using players. Again, you know, my th- thing is always keep your mind open to different things. But it's almost like it's in a strange way of losing Odegaard for literally two months already. It's, it's made me look at the team completely differently. And then I think, God, we're finding so many things. So what happens when he comes back? And mm. we're going to go, we've got levels to go, mate. Honestly, we really have. We've got levels to go yet. And then once he gets on the ball and people get attracted to him, how much space are other people going to have? You know, what's, what different sides are we going to see of them? You know, so yeah. keep the mind open to um, to what's, what's possible. Don't get first 11 obsessed. Just get what's, what's this 11 going to do obsessed? What can this 11 do on this day? Because we play Wednesday, Saturday morning, Wednesday again, Sunday afternoon, all live on TV. You know, mm-hmm. if we can't do that with 11. Do you know what I mean? So it's going to be interesting to see what we do. I, we got to get to the second half, and I think the second half is a fascinating discussion. I have so many things I want to get to in that, but there's mm. two things I want to tease out of the first half first. There is the big incident where Martinelli goes down in the box, the ball comes to Kai, Kai skies it, and I'll just level with you. I think the player I'm most frustrated with, I've seen some frustration about Martinelli. I'm more frustrated with Kai. I thought he picked a bad day to have one of his less decisive games in his touch, his control around the box, in the box. There were moments the ball came to him. There was one where the ball just passed Saka. I think it was a Martinelli cross, right? Martinelli slides it through. It just gets past Saka. And Kai is at the back post, I believe. It's Kai, isn't it? And he just sort of like, Fires it into Rosette. He could try to control it. He could try to pull it back. He just fires it into Rosette. I think the volley after the the potential penalty is a little too casual is the best way I could say it. Like, I I think he can keep that down. I know it's not super easy, but I just thought this is one of those games, and I haven't felt this way in a long time where I thought we look short a striker. Now, to be fair to Kai and Trissard, 
they're playing these weird hybrid roles where they have to drop in, receive, they have to go, they have to come back. It's it's a weird dynamic, and neither of them are being given a job just to be in the box. But for a player who has been so good for us, as Kai has been, the player we say is the irreplaceable player. In this game, I thought he, he t- turned up with one of his less convincing days physically and on the ball. Um, we'll come to the penalty in a moment, but what do you think of my take on that? Because I think a sharper Kai on this day could could have really turned the result for us. So the way, how I judge him <clears throat> is actually on duels. And I think I said on a couple of pods ago, I think I got a bit of criticism for it, that I don't think Kai had a good good game duel-wise. And people mm. said, oh, they come out and they say, oh, no, Clive, you had a great game, blah, blah, blah. Okay. He's my favorite player, by the way. So for me to say that is like um, <laughs> the big thing. He's the player that I think is most irreplaceable. Uh, the, the, I think Saka give me a run for my money on that regard. We haven't got a player that's six foot four can run the channels and do what he does and really affect centre back. So when he doesn't affect centre backs, um, then I worry about that. And I felt he'd been managed a little bit more in the duels. And one of the first games back from the injury, he was, you know, obviously not quite fit enough in that very first game. And then he's he's got a bit better, but he's been a bit patchy. You can see him fighting it, Elliot. Honestly. So sometimes he just gets on a run and goes. You think, oh, there he is. But his recovery afterwards is not like it used to be. Because I personally don't think he's training if that heavy. It's my opinion. I've got no evidence. Mm. But when you carry an injury and you're trying to work your way through an injury, the intensity of the training goes down. I, I can see it. So it's not an issue. It's just a fact of where we are at the moment. And so when you think about a striker, I think for me, and the one thing I'd like to see is another transitional threat. You know, I, I, when I watch sometimes, I'm, we know Saka when he's not fit, he, he can't do it later in the games, particularly. Martinelli, I, we left, he left a lot of juice in the tank against Shakhtar, where he was incredible, but he couldn't mm. quite repeat that level of intensity a few days later. So that transitional threat was a little bit, a little bit lower. Kai was a little bit lower. So I think... With our fatigue and issues there, we naturally play to our energy. And as yeah. our energy lowers, what you tend to do when you're when you're struggling, Elliot, you stand closer together. You go into a block and you stand closer together. You think, you know what? I'm blowing. Let me drop in and I'll yeah. rest in shape. I'll rest in shape in our 442 block. Let me rest here until I come back. When you're full of it, you know what you do? You make your run before you've even got control of the ball. You're gone. And then you're gone because you know it's coming. When you're blind, you know what you do, Elliot? You stand, not let the team down defensively. We've got a scoreboard Mm. to manage. It's just a natural thing as a football player. But again, if you're able to bring on transitional threats, then the, the threat is consistent. And so this is why, you know, the two players that I sort of liked in the past have been Sesco and Isaac, and what do they have? Big striding transitional threat. You know, mm. and you can't ignore those guys. You know, so that's what a team that's what I think this team lacks. So we we're doing it with if you look at our sort of reserve three behind the three. So Trossard for me is a come to come to feet player, you know, pocket player. Mm-hmm. Jesus, give it to my feet. I'm not going long. Give it to my feet and I'll twist and turn you. Sterling off the left, he can do his out to win run. But once you've got possession, settled possession, and he goes out to win, runs in behind from that side of things. But he's not going to run that middle of the pitch and, and transition really. At his, where he is at his stage in his career, he's more of a tricky player with the ball. So our transitional threat off the bench isn't really there. And that yeah. means we naturally settle in when we make changes. You know? And so, yeah. go on, go ahead, mate. Well, I do want to, because I do want to get to more of that um, as we flip the script to the second half. I just want to really quickly just get this out of the way. There is one angle going around on social media of the challenge, the Konate challenge on Martinelli Hmm. um, and the Trent challenge. It makes it look like Konate gets none of the ball and just takes Martinelli out. There's a reverse angle where it looks very clearly like Konate gets the ball, but in that reverse angle, it looks like Trent just kicks Martinelli in the hip. Yeah. The combination of the two of them is that, to me, it looks like it's probably a penalty. And I would say it this way. I don't have it as a, holy shit, we've been robbed call, like the sending off for kicking the ball away nonsense. Yeah, I have it as more of a, 
another example of a marginal call that I think we should get that we don't. And if I close my eyes and I'm being honest and I picture that happening at Anfield or I picture that happening at Tottenham or at Old Trafford, I cannot picture it not being given. Yeah. I do also think though, you have to create that pressure. And you talk about dark arts. I think if the team encircles Taylor after it and is outraged and that feeling of outrage extends to the crowd and there's a mob mentality, maybe there's enough there where it doesn't get a cursory glance. I think the other thing is that is works against us here, the ball falls to Kai and he gets a very, very presentable chance. If that ball squirms away to the keeper and Martinelli's down holding his leg and everybody surrounds the ref, I also think maybe he takes an extra beat and points to the spot or that the VAR takes it more seriously. So Clive, I don't have it as a patently wrong decision. I have it as a marginal call we didn't get that I I just believe that that's given at Anfield. I can't, you know, I don't have any other way to say it. Yeah, if you get two players sandwiching one player and that player goes up in the air and does a, a triple soul code, you normally should get the foul, right? But I remember Manchester United at home when Kai went between two, referee gave a penalty, they went to the screen and and basically didn't review it correctly. The penalty was overturned incorrectly. We got mm-hmm. an apology for that one. Incorrectly. And we don't get it. So with Arsenal, we seem to find a way not to give things on occasions. Um, for what I call football decisions, which are really easy to make. On the penalty, I'm 50-50, Elliot, to be honest. Um, but when Kai Wick whacks over the bar, I will look straight at Mikel, and he was head in hands, mate. He was head yeah. in hands. I think he, he doesn't all, you know, he never shows that type of emotion to his players because his players will look to him. He doesn't want to show them that he's disappointed. So he turned away, yeah. head in hands. And and I thought, oh. He did he, it one other time that half too, by the way. And you know what it was? It was when Martinelli cut inside on his right top of the box and just lashed at it into, into the yeah, upper deck. Like he, we'll, we'll, yeah. get, we'll get to him, yep. shall we, later on. Um, yep. But, yeah, it was a head in hands moment. My my view, Elliot, is quite simple. We can have these football discussions around incidents in the box, collisions in the box. We'll agree and disagree. I thought that's a 60-40 penalty, maybe even 55-45 penalty for us that we didn't get. Right, So I can live with that. Mate, I can't live with the Trossard Rice sending off at all. That's nothing to do. That's absolute crap. No. Nope. Absolute rubbish. Yep. Particularly the Trossard one. In the biggest game of the season, what are you doing? Seriously, what are you doing? And as for the Sleeper one, again, I don't want to see Van der Ven sent off. You know, I don't want to see him sent off for that. You know, it's a yellow card. You know, yellow card. You know what I do? Yeah, if I'm the referee, yellow card. I pull the skipper over and I pull Van der Ven over and say, you're on thin stuff, mate. That's a message sent to the manager. I better take him off. Because when I take him off, he's going to get sent off. That's how you manage football matches. You know, you just you just do it. It's like you just don't distort them like that like they have done for us. And you're absolutely right. Sleeper's one cost us this game as well. We don't lose that game. Miss Sleeper and Gabriel start that game. We don't get we lose it. We win that game, don't we? Mm-hmm. And so for me, I can I can live with the penalty ones. I, I really can. I, I can live with them. It's a stupidity where Arsenal seems to be setting precedents in rules that no other team gets set. That's the stuff that bothers me. You know the most. We get harshly treated on those things. We're going to agree and disagree on penalties for forever and a day, hopefully. But I don't like the way we're treated when it comes to precedents in rules where other teams don't get the same things, right? So um, that's why I'm in it. Was it Diaz who did the blatant kick away of the ball after the restart? Yeah, <laughs> start what, too. none of us were thinking I mean, about yeah, this no. until we started no. seeing Declan Rice sent off. I'm not interested in, in seeing him get booked. I'm Honestly, I'm no. not. It's crap. He should get booked for some of the fouls in the air on Thomas Pye. That's what he should get booked for. I think he made five fouls in this game. Five I fouls, know. first half, I think, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. there he, he and Did he get a yellow? I'm not sure Elliot, if, he, if he got a yellow at the end. But, you know, that's 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 the stuff you've got to be doing, referee. This is repeated fouls. He didn't get one, by the way. No, yeah, he didn't. five fouls, and he didn't get a yellow card. You, what, you're, what they're waiting so. for, should I tell you what they're waiting for? They're waiting for a technicality. Whereas the referee can then say, well, it's the rules of the game. That's easier to do rather than to tot up. Judgment calls. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And really manage and influence a game with courage. You know, that's what they're not pa- doing. 
Yeah, we something was brought up on the instant reaction that I think felt right, which is just Anthony Taylor refereed out of fear. Essentially, he didn't want he to make worried. a big call. He didn't. He didn't want to give the penalty. He didn't want to send off Van Dyke. He didn't want to disallow. Uh, he, you he know, didn't with, want with to give the corner goal, at the we'll end. To, so you know, the yeah, corner the corner. The, the corner of the funny thing is, lose your minds over referees. Don't be whatever. The not getting the corner at the end, and who knows what would have happened, but that is a corner, and to get that wrong, and all you have to do is look at the Liverpool players, right? Like, uh, I think it's Simicast, right? He's mad at himself. You can see he knows he touched yeah. his terrible call. Um, Let's do this. We're going to get to the second half and, and some of those contentious calls. We'll talk a little Martinelli as well and what this all means because I, I think people have gone way over the top on what it means to the negative, which I, I see it the other way. But before we do that, I need to, must, I am I'm implored to tell you about a new product from NordVPN called Saily. Saily, S-A-I-L-Y. This is a really clever idea. So if you ever need a SIM card for any reason, if you're traveling to other countries, used to be you'd buy a physical card, you'd slide it in. But all these phones now use eSIM, so you don't buy a physical SIM card. And Saily is an app that, from Nord where you can get coverage in over 160 countries across eight regions. And it's so great because you just tell it where you're going. You get the best possible um, deal on a SIM. You quickly just have it installed in your iPhone or Android device, and then you're done. There's 24 seven chat support, by the way. You know, if you need help, and if for some reason you get an eSIM that your phone isn't compatible with, you get a full refund. So it's a one time app download. Choose the plan that you need for where you're going, and boom, you're going to get the eSIM. The last time I was in uh, the UK slash Europe, I think I wound up with like $120 for like four days of being there in charges, which was. Not good because they had changed my plan. I didn't even know it. You can use Saley and save yourself uh, a lot of money and hassle. So right now, get an exclusive 15% discount on a Saley eSIM data plan. Download the Saley app and use code ArsenalVision at checkout. Or go to Saley, S-I-L-Y dot com slash ArsenalVision. That's S-I-L-Y, S-A-I-L-Y dot com slash ArsenalVision. Do it now. And Manscaped, I'm going to ditch with the silly Manscaped stuff for a minute because I got to tell you this. The Chairman Pro is a new electric foil shaver, a face shaver, and I got it, and it is effing brilliant. It is so good. It is definitely the best electric face shaver I've ever had. It has foil blades. It has edging blades. Careful. Um, it It is uh, waterproof. It's got a huge long battery life, a lock button for travel. Um, it has this flex adjust where the head pivots because I struggle to like shave around my neck area. It handled that just perfectly. Without a doubt, the easiest, best electric shaver I've ever had. You can take the head off to simplify cleanup or just use the, the really like small area uh, head that they give you if you want to do like the space around the nose, that kind of stuff, or, or um, near the sideburn areas. It's got a phenomenal long battery life. And I'll tell you, I, I've used other electric shavers. I never liked them. I like this one a lot. You can get 20% off and free shipping with the code ArsenalVision at Manscaped.com. That's 20% off and free shipping with code ArsenalVision at Manscaped.com. Do it now, Clark. Is that enough of that? Indeed. Not my usual humorous approach, but sometimes, sometimes these good products deserve a little bit of authenticity and sincerity. Just sometimes. Good man. Um, second half. So I just want to come to this right away. So... Gabrielle gets injured. It's like you cannot script it any worse. You're two starting center backs out. Your starting fullbacks wind up out. You're playing a midfielder, a 17-year-old, Kivior and, and White at center back. Like it couldn't be worse. And then you've got the geniuses out there saying, oh, Arsenal dropped too deep. So here's what I want to say about this, Clive. Arsenal don't attack by sending three players forward and kicking it to them. The way we dominate games is by dominating possession and territory. And the way we do that is by squeezing the pitch. And we did that to Liverpool. We were brave, we squeezed, we controlled the pitch. But look, in order to do that, your defenders have to be willing to stand in the attacking half and receive the ball and pass the ball. And of course, when you have your two starting center backs out who are two of the best center backs in the world standing inside the attacking half, knowing they can cover the space behind them, understanding their partnership with one another, who's going to drop, who's going to match a run, who's going to receive the ball and give it under pressure. What's the natural thing that's going to happen? It's going to be harder to get the defenders to hold their height. They're going to want to drop a little bit and maybe even not just want to, maybe are instructed to drop a little because a manager thinks, I can't ask Kivior and White and Skelly and Party to stand all the way up there. So we need to drop. So I don't think it's that Arsenal stopped attacking. I think it's that Arsenal's 
extremely makeshift back line reduced our ability to squeeze up the pitch and control the territory the way we might like to. And that's a bigger component. So do you think there was a conscious decision? I've been critical of us at times, sometimes dropping into our block. But I think this is different. I think this is a case of a makeshift back four defending in the areas where it needed to defend to deny transition and space to, to Liverpool. How do you see it? Yeah, we've been doing this since last season. The last 10 games of last season, we were dropping into our block. Did an OT at 1-0. And we're just very mm-hmm. efficient with our energy, you know. And um, because, you know, I can't say it, Elliot. I think you've gone into the back line, which is, which is fine. But I actually think the issue was with our wide men. Second half starts. Gabriel goes down within three or four minutes. So the whole ground is like petrified. We're thinking, oh my God, we can't lose him as well. Do you know what I mean? And it's like the air comes out of the building a little bit. He gets up. Oh, great. Then he goes down again. So the game's now lost momentum. It's all about his health and fitness. And everyone's watching the subs, thinking who's going to come on. Kivior comes on. Last scene, given the ball back, back pass back against Bournemouth. So immediately our confidence is um, a little bit lower. I don't mind Keefield's left back, but I do worry about him as a, as a centre back. I've got to be honest with you. Right? So, um, and so with Gabriel and Saliba there, he can play left back no problem. But then again, I think I could, you know, because they're that good. You know? so, so I think it's more to do with our system, but also the fact that Martinelli and Saka were losing energy. And their transition ability has disappeared a little bit. I think it's a combination, but I'm okay with it. Because I think, if anything, this team has discovered that this he can they can literally do this against anybody and do it really, really well as a unit. The Man City game is in our DNA. It's in us now, the Man City away game. So we know what we can do, you know? Yeah. We know we can do this, so they feel very comfortable doing it. But the issue is, when we attack, we've got to attack with a bit more brains, we've got to attack a bit more efficiency and be a bit more clinical. Ten men against Brighton, we we, had, we transitioned really, really well. We blew three chances. We blew it, right? Um, mm. I I don't mind what we're doing, I'll be honest with you. We not, when, when the ball rolls into Odegaard's feet and he beats two men in, in, the, in the press and then suddenly everyone's sprinting because now he's going to beat two men on the press, we won't be saying this. Trust me, we won't be saying this. You know, and um, because he'll just get the ball, you know, out of the phone box and we're off and running. And we'll be flying at the pitch. Everyone's going to say, oh, my God, Arsenal are flying at the pitch again. He's just quality of player in those areas, right? He's just better. He's better than Kai and Trossard receiving in tight spaces and playing and waiting for people to move to then give it to them on the gallop. He's better at that. That's his, that's his thing. And so until we got these players available, we have to show a different face. So... Partly, to, I think you're right. Partly, the back line was happier, closer to its goal. But partly, I think we lost our transitional energy, you know, with fitness and health. <clears throat> Timber, struggling. You know, Party was brilliant in this game, but he's a, he's a 31-year-old right back. He's going to feel yeah. it. That's not his position. So what do yeah. you tend to do when you feel it? You stand a bit more. When they bring on Gakpo, six foot two, full of legs, full of running, he handled him. But he had to stand a bit more. He's not going to overlap, is he? He's not going to leave them behind. What happened on the goal? We left the guy behind, left him, the best striker in the last five years, and he and he picked our pockets, right? So it's just the nature of the game. We're not playing the dog and duck. These are good players, and you have to manage them and see them off, see them off. And we didn't quite do it. I ended up in a 2-2 draw, which... You know, and let's be honest, we're adults. It's probably a fair result. Probably a fair result. It's a good game. You know, I know no one cares about that. It's a good game. No. It's a well-played game between two very good teams. And the team that had more of their top players available had enough at the end to get something from a game where they were otherwise outplayed. Yeah. You know, that's how I see it. Um, and I think the way we played in the second half is a reflection of our availability and our fatigue. Yeah, to your point, like Kai Havertz has just been overplayed this season because we haven't had an option. I, I got to be honest with you. I would have liked to have seen Jesus earlier. Yeah, me too, a fraction but, earlier. Yeah, because I think that whatever you think of him, and I know there are people that are just outrageously frustrated with him at this point, 
I think he could have caused some problems for tired legs and maybe just reinvigorated our attack. And oh, by the way, the thing I think he can do better than Trossard is I think he can provide exits when you're starting to sink a little deeper. I agree. That is I thing agree. he does really well. I'm going to tell you this for but free. Sorry, yeah, look, just, yeah. I've got to hold you there. Mm -hmm. I, I think you're right in what you say. Mm -hmm. But you know what the manager didn't know that me and you didn't know? He knew exactly how long Saka would last. And he had to save Jesus, great Jesus for that. Well, right? here's the problem. This is the problem. This is why I couldn't bring Jesus on for Trossard. Because he doesn't trust Sterling. I think we might be in big trouble with Sterling. I was beside myself with how he played against Shakhtar. Beside myself. Not because he's not good going forward. He does not work defensively at all. Period. Yeah. And I, I really mm. think if you had a, a Raheem Sterling that you trusted to do the defensive work, you could bring Jesus in for Trissard. You could bring Sterling in for Saka. Clive, I, I might be doing the thing I do where I go over the top on stuff, but <laughs> I'm, I'm concerned about that. I, I, I mean, I think it says a lot that we didn't see Sterling in this game. I, I do. He, he he made a choice, right? He's the manager can't win, can he? Because he brought on Ethan Wanieri instead of Sterling in the in the interior. Yeah. I think Ethan Yeri is the right player to bring on on this day. I agree. Yeah, I wonder what um, Sterling thinks about that, though. <laughs> I, I don't, mate. I tell you what, you, I tell you what, you got to think about it, Sterling is sharpen up in training and get better. That's what I think yeah. about it. And, and do your simple work as that. Ethan Yeri is the future of our club. Raheem Sterling, a really, really good player. He's on loan mm -hmm. for Reese Nelson money. So I'm sorry, I'm prioritizing the player that could be anything for us. They're the best. Along with the boy at Spurs, he's the best player in the country for his age. Right? So he, he comes on. Don't worry about that. You've got to get him signed up for a contract. He comes on, mate. So, so the rest of them. By the way, Mickey, um, Mickey Moore, Mikey Moore, the, the Mikey guy, Moore, the guy at yeah. Spurs. I think worth noting, that guy who, you know, again, praise to the Rafters for his age, was dreadful at the weekend <laughs> against Palace. So it's a big step up for these kids to play at this level. You know, He's a really good young player. He reminds me of a young Smith Rowe, bouncy player, socks roll down. Really can bounce on the outside on the left hand side. Watch him at his age group, he rips it, mate. Him and Wanieri rip it together. I've been talking about it for a while, and um, it was great against what Panathinaikos in midweek, but he yeah. plays Premier League at the weekend, and he's not at the level. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and and Ethan's come on. He's come on late in games against Premier League players, and he's really shone. You know, and he's really looked good. His time's coming. Sterling thing. You know, I've seen him a couple of times off the left. I think he looks quite good. Um. What you're in your head, you're just saying, look, we've got Sterling, we've got Ethan, and we've, we've lost Smith Rowe, Nelson, and Eddie. That's what we're really saying here, aren't we? We're saying Kai's now a forward. He's not a midfielder because we bought Marino. So you look at Marino, you look at Sterling, you look at Ethan. That allows us to, to lose the three tailenders, right? So, and Vieira. And so you take your choice, right? You take your choice. We've got to get Sterling up to speed. I wouldn't say he doesn't trust him because I think the manager really likes him. But if you're not doing the job, you won't play. So you know, this, yeah. isn't, this isn't a charity. Do your job. Yeah. And then you'll play. Simple. Yeah. Yeah, well, we'll see. I mean, it, there were a lot of interesting decisions he could have made. I mean, ultimately, I think the story of the second half is Gabrielle and Timber coming off and having to play with what that we had it. available. I mean, and and – you know, look, if you want to be frustrated with mainstream media, be my guest because I'm as frustrated with it as, as anyone. I just avoid it because if you can't see that Arsenal played with the most makeshift backline imaginable for a good chunk of the second half against a team that's supposedly one of the best in the Premier League, like, I can't help you. And you want them to go attack. Well, the one time we did try to go attack and our lines got stretched a little bit, that left-hand side of Kivior and Miles Lewis Skelly got exposed. So yeah, what do you want us to do? You want us to play naive? You know, we played quote unquote the right way under Arsene Wenger the last 10 years he was manager and all we heard is how na naive and soft we were. What do you want us to do? Stretch out our lines with a 17 year old, 18 year old left back and give your left center back and, and wait to see how long one of the best wingers in the history of the league can, can take to, to punish us. I, I'm really curious about a comment Mikel made Clive in his, in his post-match comments, Mikel kept referencing the one thing that the team didn't do today. Yeah. The one thing we didn't do, I'm more disappointed and frustrated. This is a quote. I'm more disappointed and frustrated about one thing that we didn't do that we had to do in the second half. And then when pressed on it, he said, I'll keep that to myself. What is the one thing? I think he did not want to give them wide spaces to run into. And so there's something that I, I, saw, I, I got a good view of this, mate. Absolutely got a good view of this. 
Miles Lewis Gary was running down the left wing. And how, for those that are keen Arteta watchers, when we win the ball and we're about to progress the ball, he always puts his arms out in front of him and he says, calm, slow down. First time I saw this was City at home, the one nil Martin Eddie scored. I thought, why is he slowing us down? And I thought, okay, he's slowing us down so we can get into defensive shape and proper attacking shape. So the ball gets turned over, we're in position. He wants to slowly attack down on occasions, particularly when, we, when, we, when we're up on the scoreboard. So what does Miles do? So he runs down the left, towards left wing. And Martinelli decides to make an out-to-in run into Canate and Trent. And he wants to bring the ball with him, one touch, and beat them both. I have to be honest with you, I was disappointed in this. right? Because what should have happened was that we Miles chops forward, Martinelli holds his whip, we knock it to Martinelli, he travels 10 yards, chops it back to, to Miles. Miles at the edge Miles. of the area. Yeah, yeah sorry, did I say something else? Chops it back no, to no, Miles at the edge of the area. And we, we're, we've we got them pushed back into their box. And then we attack from there. But by taking them on, and it's a, ter- it's a terrible thing to say. It doesn't sound right, does it? What's he trying to do? He's trying to take them on the outside? That's not a crime. It's not a crime. But the problem is, we weren't, we weren't ready to counter-press once we lost it. So you're now given... Trent Alexander-Arnold, time, on his right foot, to get his head up. Your left back is trying to get back in. He's not fully back in. Right? So, and keep your thinking, I've got to sort of half do that job. Do I do I do it? Do I? How do I do it? I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll step into it, hoping that Trent won't find a good pass. He steps it. Oh, shit, it's a good pass. I've now got to run backwards. And, and... That's it. And so it runs past Salah into Nunes. Salah's just like picking, taking candy from babies. He cuts a diagonal inside, perfect pass, slot into the side netting. And that was caused by our attack being yeah. too uncontrolled. And I know it sounds boring to people, but that's what he didn't want. That's what he didn't want. They weren't going to score. We were in our settled shape, in our. And nope. I said, oh, block, no chance. Nope. I urge you to watch the Forest game, because I did. I watched the Forest game. They lost at home to Forest, and they lost 1-0. And the little people I know said, we wouldn't have scored till Tuesday. And Forest just sat and waited and waited and waited and got them on the counter, and Hudson Doy scored. It's we. I think Arteta knew what he wanted to do. That's why he went into shape. That's why he sat in once he had the goals. My only regret was we didn't score two goals before they got their set piece goal. I wanted I wanted a two 0 half time because I think we'd have seen a really conservative counter attacking system, and we'd have, and we'd have won that game. So that was the error earlier, and it was it, for me. That's why Martinelli got hooked because I was I wanted to hook Tossard first, but I think he was disappointed in Martinelli in this game because I think he misread the moment. It's a small error, but he misread the moment. And th- just after that moment, he was starting to really support Miles really, really well in that half, which he did on many occasions. But it sounds crazy to criticise a kid for attacking too quickly and aggressively, but we weren't in shape to counter-press and keep them in those areas. So we create the transition and they punished us. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I think the one thing that we couldn't do is allow transitions. No transitions. Because if you let them run into space with Nunez's pace and Salah's cleverness and Trent's ball, you know, that he can play from anywhere, you're going to get burned. And I think what that means is when you're attacking, you have to wait for your lines to get reset. And we got stretched out. It's a phrase, isn't it? Offensive distances. Yeah, we got stretched out. And so when Martinelli loses the ball there, and on its face, he doesn't have a lot of support. He's running at full tilt. He thinks he can get past two. He can't. But now we're stretched. I wonder if the one thing the team didn't do, though, is foul. Yeah, You have to foul Trent. I wonder if that's the thing he means. Because yeah. it's funny. A lot of people are frustrated with Martinelli. Some people with Skelly. Some people with Kivior. You have to foul Trent. You have so to it, take it the card. It was Marino to... and Rice. I, w- I wasn't sure which mm-hmm. way around it was. I haven't got a picture in my mind. Mm-hmm. I'm sure the listeners thinking it was Rice. It was, like, but but I felt we stood off them in that phase. We didn't 
get their heads yep. down. We didn't counter press. We didn't we, get, we their didn't heads get down. In, We didn't get physical. Yep. We didn't get their heads down, and that gave them a chance to pick it up. And mate, I'm, I'm, I had a perfect view. I'm afraid to see us get sliced open, and um, you're just hoping for a bad pass. You know, Ben White was there thinking, just give me a bad pass so I can nick it. Got nothing, and they just it just it's a very very good goal from their point of view. Got to accept it. Got to accept it. it. It's a really good goal, but I, again, I, and I'm gonna I'm gonna pick on Kivior here. I I think he's the most at fault. All right, again, I don't think Martinelli should lose the ball where he does. I think he takes on the wrong choice. I think we should foul Trent once the play is developing. Though I watched this like 37 times this morning because I want to really try to get a feel for it. Yeah, Skelly's caught Miles Lewis Skelly's caught a little bit up the pitch. But he's going to be in a running race with Salah to the corner if if Kivior doesn't make one critical error, which is he drops and decides he's going to track the run out wide. Two things happen because of that. The space in the middle just gets totally vacated, and that gives Salah the run that he winds up making. But if he just holds centrally, both Nunez and Salah are going to be offside there. Both of them. So I think he blows it. And I mean... Here's the reality, though. You got Kivior playing left center back, which he's not done for us ever, I think, in a competitive fixture. You've got Miles Lewis Kelly, an 18 year old, playing right back against Nunez and Salah and Trent Alexander Arnold. Yeah. So like just sometimes it's that simple. And yeah. this is where I think mainstream media falls down. Trent Alexander Arnold is one of the best fullbacks in the world in terms of his delivery. Mohamed Salah is one of the best wingers in the world. And Darwin Nunez is one of the fastest, strongest, paciest center forwards in the world. And they're up against Kivior call it fourth choice center back and an 18 year old fullback fresh out of the academy. Who's really a midfielder. Late, late, yeah. Late. Who's, who's naturally a midfielder. If you can't see how, what, what's going on there, you know, and, and you can't have it both ways. Do we stay compressed and compacted in our block to protect them? So we get the win or do you stretch it out and try to attack and get caught on the counter? Well, we did it one time and we got caught. So it's unfortunate. I do think there's a lot of frustration with Martinelli. Clive, so I want to just bring this up. I actually, I think what he does for the goal is poor, but I think, you know, just because you lose the ball in the attacking penalty box doesn't mean you need to concede a goal. I think the single biggest thing we didn't do was foul to stop the counter. I am sure what Mikel said going into the match and going into the half is don't let the lines get stretched, and if they get stretched, take someone down. Do not let them run at our back line over no. distance. Do not give Trent the ability to play those balls in behind. Take them down early, and we didn't do it, but... Setting that aside, there's some frustration with Martinelli, and I'm curious where you are in the player. I think he helped out defensively a lot, and he created his share of threat. He was be he had the beating of Trent all he wanted. Kanate did well with him. But I think the frustration is just stemming more from the execution with the final ball in the final third. And when you see what Bakayo Saka gives us, I think there's a growing question about whether we need someone who's more of a killer on the left. And the irony with Martinelli when he broke into the team is that's exactly what it was, a killer. An assist and a goal machine. A guy who got the end product right more often than not. Um, where are you on that scale of frustration uh, with Martinelli? So he was man of the match against Shakhtar, clearly. You know, mm -hmm. clearly. Yep. Empty the tanks maybe too much, but he was clearly man of the match. And um, <clears throat> it wasn't for him, he wasn't worth a ticket price. Honestly, he was really, really good. And and I thought, I was hopeful for him. But God be honest here, I thought Kanate spooked him. I thought he spooked him quite early, and he dominated mm. him. It wasn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't about Trent. Trent was just there as next to body. It was about Kanate. And that's why I think he made that run. He wanted to catch him out, to take it on him early, to take the speed on him early. He, he, that's a run I don't see him do. I don't know why he did that. He received it to feet, and he didn't fancy it. He wanted to take him on the run. So I was a bit, you know, he sort of, this is where experience comes in, Elliot. And this is why and I have got I have got an issue, and I am I am one for playing the kids. But I'm asking myself a question: Why uh, the re Ukrainian captain is sitting on the bench, and we don't think he can do twenty minutes at the end of a game? Where well, I think he can, Isinchenko has that ball. I guarantee you, he lends it to Martinelli and gets it back. Do you know what mm. I mean? He lends it and gets it back. He he's an experienced twenty seven year old pro. Um, and this is my feeling. So if you want to play the kids, this is what happens on occasion. We have to accept it. Um, I was speaking to Adrian Clark earlier today, and he said something really smart. He said, if you watch Timber playing against Salah, he never left him. Not yeah. once. Not once did he leave him. Now, do you think Gabriel's going to let Miles trot off into midfield 
and not pulling back in. This is what happens with inexperienced players that don't feel that confident. Keep your thought, you know, I'll try to do the job on my own here. Makes a step, the wrong step, suddenly we're running back to dodge. It's like experience said, Oi, get back in here. Do, do you see what I mean? And, um, mm. But we, but Elliot, the other side of that coin is Mark Nelly takes it, has a better touch, gets a corner, and we score from the corner, win the game 3 1. Do, do you see what I mean? I can't criticize too much. I'm just telling you what happened and how we left ourselves vulnerable. We had, I think we only had one corner in this game. So we weren't getting around the outsides. We weren't getting in behind them. We weren't getting those crosses deflected for corners. So Mark Lee was trying to get in behind them. So I can't kill him for that. But I think he just lacked a bit of juice on the day. And I think he got, I think Canate handled him. In the last game, this is my issue with the game. This is, we'll, when we do the rewatch, I'm, I'm going to say this, but I'm not too sure of my, of my statement. I wanted to see Kai and Trossard impact Van Dijk and Canate more. Yep. That's my feeling I had. Because if they, if Canate can spend all his time over there, that means there's space for somebody else and you ain't taking yep. it. That's the way yep. I look at it. You know, if Canate, yep. if, if Canate, six foot five, is all, he's smashing up Martinelli, there's no problem. Boy, you've got Van Dyke there. and Get around him. Get around him. Unsettle him. Make Canate protect the middle. And then, and then Mark has got his one-on-ones. I don't think we affected the centre-backs enough. That's my gut feeling. Please, t- the listener, get in the comments and tell me if I'm right. I, I ain't watched it again yet. But that's my feeling. Well, that's my feeling. And I, I do think if we were able to bring on Jesus for Trissard earlier, we might have gotten a little more of that. And I, I think Jesus that. and Martinelli have had a good why. understanding. We know I, why. We know, I know why. We have players that were not, that were on the team sheet, that were not scheduled to end that game. I will say this, though. You know, Jorginho did not get on in this game. Zinchenko was not trusted in this game. Jesus got six minutes. Sterling got no minutes. It is starting to feel, if I and I, I don't really have many negative thoughts coming out of this game, but like if I, if I wanted to find a place to be concerned, it is starting to feel like the squad is quite small because players that I would have thought were very much in the reckoning to be part of it maybe aren't. Zinchenko looks not in the reckoning. Jorginho does not look to be much of a part of it. Um, Jesus and Sterling, I'm not saying they're not trusted, but maybe trusted a bit less than I would have thought. And if I combine all of this together, certain departments look a little light. I mean, the midfield should be fine, but we've just gotten used to Thomas Party being available every game. And if he's not, suddenly Jorginho becomes a player we got to talk about because he's not playing. So there's some of those things... In there, we don't need to go too deep on it today. By the way, the one corner we got was Ethan Winery, and I think it's worth mentioning. Brilliantly taken corner, by the way, yeah. by Ethan Winery, um, who had another really nice cameo. You're finishing the game with a 17 year old and 18 year old on the pitch. It was a very makeshift Arsenal by the end. And yeah, eventually, eventually, no matter how well coached you are, to your point, Clive, if you suck enough talent out of the team that's on the pitch, the advantage tilts to the other team. And you, if you, know, you can only overcome that with Keeble structure so much. Standing, they're not even they're not even running into that space, mate. Exactly. That's what all runs exactly. to you. They're not even running down that channel. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Simple. Or as he that. doesn't pick the wrong run and play everybody on side and get and get sucked out wide. So they're yeah, I, I agree with you. Um, and you know, by the way, yeah, there's frustration for me that someone like Tomiyasu isn't available because it's a different game if he's if he's there. You know, but we've. We've kind of gotten into a bad situation with with him just obviously not being available as well. So all those things played into it. Look, there's the disallowed goal. And I'm confused by it, candidly, because if it's for Kivior's leap, if he thinks that's a foul, and that's never a foul, you would think he'd blow right away. He doesn't blow right away. He lets it develop. Then he blows for Kivior's leap. Now, look, there's a lot of potential fouls in this in this move. Yeah. I watched it a thousand times. Kai jumps into Kanate with a swinging arm, and then the ball comes off his arm. Whether that's a handball, you be the judge. I don't know what a handball is anymore. I think there are a few ways VAR could have ruled this goal out, but I think the obvious thing that Taylor has to do is let the play develop, and if the ball goes in, let VAR sort out if there is an infraction, because Kivior's leap certainly is not one. What do you think? Mate, if we can get players sent off by the corner flag for flicking the ball away two yards, there's no way they're going to find a reason to give that goal. 
I, I, I've just, um, I've just moved on from it. You know, um, it, it, it looked to me it was a Kivior foul because of where they spotted the free kick afterwards was where Kivior jumped in, and for once yeah. Kivior was aggressive. I'm thinking, get in there, my son, do it a bit more often. I don't mind what you do, just do it. Don't half and half it. Just do it. If you're gonna smash someone, smash them. You know, if you're gonna drop off, then drop off. You know, mm-hmm. that's my issue with with him really. It's just not being definite enough. And um so yeah, it drops to Kai and Kai wins a challenge and Kanate then holds his face. The cute one. Let me hold my face, mm-hmm. see if I can cute the referee. Then he sees it developing, Kanate and thinks, Oh my god, they might score. <laughs> yeah, and so his face suddenly got fixed real quick. Do you know what I mean? Because you hadn't mm-hmm. heard the whistle yet. Then the whistle Can someone comes. do that for me? Yeah. It's my face real quick. And um, then, of course, he flips it over and the referee then blows. Trent hasn't heard the whistle, so he's fighting like crazy to save it. Havertz then throws Trent into the net and Jay-Z scores, right? So, Elliot, for me, another 50-50, probably 60-40 against us in that one. I can't, you know, for me... It would have been nice if he let the whole thing play out and then let other people decide if it's a um, a foul or not. But not Anthony Taylor, mate. Let me control this. And, uh, and while the players are talking to him, I think there's some substitutions being made. He was much happier to make the substitutions thereafter. He lacked authority. He looked afraid, Elliot. And that's meant to be our second best referee. The other, we have two referees on the elite UEFA list. Him and Michael Oliver. Michael Oliver, last seen in the VAR room, given a penalty against Manchester United with five minutes to go. And uh, we had the other one. So that's where that's the state of our refereeing. You know, it's not very good, is it? Yeah. Mikel, on the decisions made by the officials, prefer not to comment. On whether he was told why the goal was disallowed, I like this. No, nothing. I'm sure we'll have some clarity or a letter afterwards. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, And you know what? I think he's doing the right thing because I will tell you the negative mental impact of believing the referees are holding you back is you now create an external locus of control. And I want to say this, not just to to you, Clyde, but to everybody listening. And I think this is what you have to say. If you are a football manager, you want an internal locus of control, not an external locus of control, because once there's an external locus of control, it's out of your hands. And if it's out of your hands, why put in the hard yards? Why put in the graft? Why put in the effort? It's out of your hands. And I think we reached a dangerous point now where even if it is true that the refereeing has become an enormous problem, not just for Arsenal, but for the league, and I believe it has, that once there is an external locus of control, for us as podcasters, there's things we can't analyze anymore. For a manager, it's hard to motivate. For a fan base, it's hard to care because it has nothing to do with us and what we do on the pitch. So I would simply try to keep it as an internal locus of control because, Clive, the alternative is just unpleasant. It's unpleasant. And we are so good that I'd like to try to enjoy that. Um, th- and that's why I think both with media... Yeah, go ahead, please. Mm-hmm. May <clears throat> I've come to the conclusion that I want to see referees from around the world coming into our league. Simple as that. <clears throat> our league is richer for having players, foreign players coming in. The standard's gone up. And the, p- the football we're watching now compared to what we're watching 20 years ago is night and day for many different reasons. But the pool of players the talent is broader, much broader. The standard's going higher. Yet, the referee pool is all within 25 miles of Old Trafford. Why is that the case? Why is everything else being broadened? Why is everything else, standards going up? In every single football department, to do with football, media, clubs, commercial, sports science, SNC, coaching, specialised coaching, learning from the NFL, learning from the NBA, learning from rugby, everything's going up. You know what's not going, getting better? It's those idiots, those bald idiots that come from Manchester. They're still the same blokes. It's time to change mm. it, mate. It's time to change it. It's not going to change. Forget about Arsenal. This is a football problem. We're the, At the moment, we're getting what Wolves got last year. We're getting a bit of that. Do you know what I mean? Um, but this is a football problem. This is this is absolutely a football problem. How can you give that penny against Manchester United with five minutes ago? How can you do that? You know, how can you seriously? How can you do that? You know, I, I they, they don't know what they're doing, and that's the truth. It's not an easy job. We have no game without them. When I used to play, 
I used to pray the referee would turn up because I was so desperate to play the game. So I've always appreciated referees because we don't have anything without them. But they're resting on their laurels. I watched I watched the Liga this week and I looked at the technology in that Classico game. We looked like some old antiquated dog, didn't we? When we scored that second yep. goal, it took, I don't know how long it took, but you know what was lost, Elliot? Any momentum we may have had after scoring, it had gone, mate. It had gone, you know? Evan went to the toilet in the ground, come back, and the goal still hadn't been given. That's just rubbish. Look, when Mikel said, it's embarrassing what we're doing, he knew what he meant. It's, it's how we're doing this. It's embarrassing, our lack of technology, our lack of using automated offsides. We've got to get better. We've got to have better cameras. We've got to improve our show and stop turning people away from this game. You know, we've got to get better. The- we're resting our laws because we've got the most cash. We'll use the cash to get the best referees in. When I watch the Champions League games, mate, I know who the referee is and I don't care. I'll sit next to my mate Trevor at the games and the first thing we do is say, who we got today then on the back of the programme? Oh, him. We know all about him. We've got 15 games we can rattle off what he's done against us. That's, that's a problem. They've been around yeah. too long and they're not getting better. I think the Premier League is probably the worst run professional sports league in the world of the major sports leagues. Mm. And I don't think it's particularly close. How can you watch the Classico and just oh. instantly have everybody I know tell me, this is so much better than the Premier League. Yeah. The technology is better. The camera angles are better. The camera quality is better. They got pit cameras on the pitch. They got people with steady cams behind the goals for corners. They got overlaid graphics that the broadcasters are using to show where the corner kicks tend to go. They got it all. The NFL puts cameras in the end zone pylons. So yeah. that you can see if a shoelace crosses the plane. But we can't tell if a ball went out at Newcastle because oh. we don't have a camera angle. Put a camera in the post of the goal. Put a camera in the corner flag. Why aren't they there? Why aren't there referees from other leagues? The single most important person on that pitch for any game is the referee. The referee has the ability to make the game work or make the game not work. And you're hiring from a pool of 10 people in one region of one country of the world. The whole thing is crazy. Meanwhile, the biggest, the richest club is suing the league. The league is suing the richest club. The rules around ownership are a muddled mess. The rules around spending have just been thrown out by a court. The Premier League is in a really precarious position right now. Because if they can't get all of their hands around this and start understanding the rules that govern their member clubs, have their member clubs agree to the rules and participate with them, have their broadcasters have access to the technology they need to broadcast the game better, have the referees control the game in a better way, have technology that looks like it's from the millennium that we're living in, then eventually, eventually, eventually people will migrate. I won't because I'm going to love Arsenal till I die with every bit of my heart and soul. Clive's not going anywhere. But you know what? The next generation that's watching TikTok right now, convince them they should watch this over the classical. It was a better, it was a better entertainment, better broadcast. Yeah. Better referee. I, we, you know, the, the, I, just, I worry, Clive, that this league does not have its hands around the things that are going to help the next generation of people feel like this is where they should be investing their time we're and their, not, we're not and their focused. energy. Moment, we're not focused on... We're not focused on what we should be focusing on. Right at the moment, the Premier League is focusing on lawyers and fighting off Man City, right? So we're not we're mm-hmm. not focused on things. We're not focused on the thing. We have a fantastic opportunity where the eyes of the world are right? the reason why everyone watches our football is because it's, it's quite competitive. There are ten super clubs, and when you when a camera pans into the crowd, mate, there's not a seat to be had anywhere. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. And so, and then people are watching it all around the world. But because of that, just, just no lapse of honour, make it better. Just make it, what's your strategy to make this better? You know? Yeah. Work harder. When they select Anthony Taylor for the Arsenal game, why? What's that based on? What's the data telling them? What's that based on? Does he deserve to be selected for that game? Was it based on Howard Webb's gut? What's that based on? It's got to be done on merit. You don't get a big game this, you're good. It's got to be done on merit, you know? Then you take, you make that transparent. Then you take away any conspiracy. Bring people in for these big games who have no history with these teams. Do it properly. Take the risk away. You know, they're not smart, mate. They're not smart enough. They're not, not high quality enough. The quality of people are not good enough. It's clear to me. Absolutely clear. Forget, honestly, when I say this, forget Arsenal. This is about football. I want the Premier League to be better than this. It should be. You know? It's got the money. 
It's got the money. It's got the eyeballs. It's got the passion. Uh, look, I love the Premier League. I, I have never loved sport the way I love the Premier League and Arsenal, which is maybe why I get so upset at a league that I see resting on its laurels, just telling the, the goose to lay more golden eggs without actually trying to give it whatever food a goose needs to lay golden eggs. Mm. Um, l- last thought here. Look, th- they get the goal. It's frustrating. Our goal is disallowed. I don't think it should be. And and we don't have a clear answer on it. And it, it it's just another bad taste in the mouth moment. I think it's unfortunate for the youngsters that came on that they weren't able to to get the three points. But I will say, at, because it is October and not April, this three point this point split is still a point that tells me Arsenal are better than Liverpool and that Arsenal are are still the strongest team even when depleted. I I think there are people that are saying the title is gone, and I will say this as clearly as I can, Clive. I came away from this feeling, as long as we eventually get fit and sooner rather than later. I just don't think there's any scenario where we aren't right there at the very end to potentially win this title. I I think this could be an 88-point title type season. I think we are very much in the running to get to that. But it is clear to me, we need some marginal calls to start going for us. And we need and we need players back. Because at the end of the day, no matter how good Mikel is, and boy, is he good, we need players back. We need Saliba and Gabriel at the heart of our central defense. We need Martin Odegaard pulling the strings between the lines so that we can some days play party, but sometimes it's Rice and Marino, whatever it is. Yeah. We need some players back. If that happens, I come away from this game feeling we are going to be right there till the very, very end. Yeah, I came away. I came away a little bit guy, but also very encouraged. Because I think if we can, if we can do that with this, <laughs> mm-hmm. How good we're gonna get, right? And um, so yeah, but it's about we need a bit of luck with injury, Elliot. You know, the, the Odegaard one hurt. You know, um, we really did hurt. We've we, we lost two major players in, in internationals. Got one more to go. Then it will settle down for Christmas. And the, I don't think we leave London for a long time over Christmas, according to the schedule. So we've got a chance to have maybe a bit of a better break with traveling and players stay in their beds a little bit longer and they come in there fresher and it's just these details really matter they really matter and um so yeah well i'm really hopeful and i'm trying to ignore last season and look at man city and say yeah well, i'm watching them and you know, i watched the they won one nil against southampton people say it's going to be 10 well it was one nil and um at the end of the game i looked at harland and he had his hands on his knees They've got no backup for him. None. You know, literally none. You know, so things can change very, very quickly, right? we just got to keep doing our work, get our players fit and healthy, and um, see what we do. See what we do. Yeah, I, I think we can leave it there. Look, I, I kind of think... <laughs> Please don't play anybody we care about at all against Preston. And frankly, it might be the best thing that ever happened. Arsenal just, you don't want to crash out against Preston. But like, no. we don't need a two-legged semifinal in this competition in January. I will tell you that much. We don't need yeah. that. Well, um, so the people already say we need to win more things. So my view is, let's ignore use those people. <laughs> I promise you this. Ask Eric Ten Hag. No one is going to be putting League Cup on our CV as a way to celebrate if that's all we come away with this season. Yeah. We have bigger aspirations. Let's stay focused on them. Let's let's leave it there. We're going to, I think, do a rewatch of the first half of this game. We'll do a power rankings pod this week. Um, we, we got a lot of stuff to do. And obviously, there'll be an instant reaction following, uh, following the Preston game. So stay with us all, all week, all season, because there's a lot more good to come from this arsenal. And I think if you can keep the locus of control internal and stop focusing on a mainstream media narrative that's not worth the time and a refereeing situation that is frustrating, but not within our control, then I think you can enjoy it. And hopefully we can all enjoy it together. Clive, I enjoy you. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much. My name is Elliot Smith. You can block me on Twitter, Inc. Gunner. We love you. And we will talk to you after Arsenal 10, Preston Nil.